I found informational marketers, business coaches, event hosts, podcast hosts, they would pay a lot of money and it was real easy to get results. So the results that I was used to delivering, I could still deliver, but I could charge like five or six times more. I mean First and foremost, Web3, right? I think you've been in the game relatively long or longer than most creators. And I'm not in too deep just yet. I have just trading accounts really on a couple like crypto exchanges. Um, and I have a mentor who's actually helping me there, but that's about it. Um, I guess to start this conversation, Gary, like what do people need to know about Web3 as it stands today? So NFTs, blockchain, crypto and creating in that world. Yeah, it's it's a wild world it's a shared ownership space so you know in a traditional setting you you find your favorite creator and you might buy their merch or you buy their book or you buy their course or you know you could subscribe to them on twitter or youtube or wherever else in a web3 world we buy their tokens and we hold their tokens and we rep their tokens and then at a certain point in time in the future as the brand grows we sell their tokens and when we sell their tokens we make the gain in the middle so what I always dealt with was I would go join a mastermind or join a group and bring all right. my friends with me. Right. You're like, hey, let's go. Let's go here. Let's go here. Let's go here. All of a sudden the, the group's full and I move on. I cancel. Well, what happens? They just replace me. But in a Web3 model, when I cancel, I get to sell the asset and I might have a huge spread in the middle. So I, as a collector, get to benefit from the upside. As a creator, I get to profit from the upside and I get a shared ownership. You know, They say whenever people pay, they pay attention. I can tell you when they own, they take ownership. Does that value deferential basically just come from more people joining the community? Is that where the value is? Well, it's there's a couple of elements here. So you've got the in a traditional creator, we sell what we want. So we sell a membership or we sell something and not everybody wants that thing that we sell. Mm -hmm. But when it's in Web3, it's a social token or it's an NFT, a collectible. It's yep. something that anybody can grab. Anybody can grab a collectible, an NFT. Anybody can grab a social token or a crypto token. Like you don't have to be the biggest fan. You can just be a small fan. Kind of like if we went to a concert, even if we didn't love the band, we might grab a little souvenir. When we're looking at most creators, it's like you grab an overpriced t-shirt or an overpriced hat or you grab their book, but there's nothing to keep moving in. This creates an opportunity for someone to grab it. And like, I'll, I'll give you a, a real quick example. Um, this gentleman reached out to me. I met him on Twitter spaces and he said, I'd really like to learn how to grow my personal brand. I right. said, perfect. It's five grand to work with me for a period of time, 15 mm -hmm. grand for this other period of time, or you can go buy 25,000 Gary coin and 25 giraffe and just hold them. You buy and hold just like you might buy and hold Bitcoin or ETH or something like that. He said, well, that sounds good. What do I get? I said, direct access to me. So he went out and spent roughly 10 grand, bought assets, holds them, and now he has direct access to me. Now he's going to build with us. He's going to benefit with us. He has a vested interest in going out and promoting us, talking about us, you know, being excited about what we're building because he owns a chunk of assets and those assets have real life value. And then in the future, when he's done and he's, you know, five years from now, two years from now, whenever it is, and he's ready to move on, he can sell those assets and pull back any profits or gains that he has. Or, you know, depending on where we stand, he might be able to give them away. He might be able to, to flip them or you know, he might be able to use them and do a lot of other things with them. Where traditionally, if he would have paid me, he would have paid me, I would have taken his money, I would have delivered and we would have been done. Now our relationship continues on indefinitely. So the ongoing stake in the growing pool of the, the collective creation, plus the ability to add elements like access for the creator or even of nostalgia as the brand grows over time is really where the value is. Yeah. And just, I mean, we place value on different things. So I do a podcast like you. And whenever I do a podcast, I bring in an audience live. And if you show up live, I give you a collectible, kind of like the poster of the, of the podcast. Well, somebody took one of those posters and they traded it for something that's worth 150 bucks last night. They got it for free for showing up and listening to the podcast and learning. And then they traded it and got something worth 150 bucks. Real money. Yeah. Real, real money. Right. So it's, Someone showed up and learned and listened. That's what I wanted them to do because I want a live audience when I do my shows. They collected something of value, which they traded and got something they wanted. So it creates this, this, this weird economy that starts to move around where people are, some people are showing up and listening and then they're like, oh shit, I learned. I didn't even realize I could learn this and then I could go take action. Some people are doing it just to get the collectibles. Some people are doing it because they want to learn the information. It, it, it just creates a weird dynamic that I've never seen Every other customer I'd worked with, we had done monthly memberships and we see these negative indicators that go off in people's brain when they cancel or when the credit card declines. But here, when they go to like leave, they sell their asset and they get money back. 
nobody's mad when they get money back. Right, right. Your mission is to turn the next generation of creators into millionaires. So how is Web3 really democratizing the creator economy and making it easier for people like us, podcasters? I'm a blogger, video creators or content creators. You know, I was on Instagram. That was my thing for the last few years. How are those people now able to scale and monetize what they're good at and what they love easier than before? Yeah, every platform takes a huge percentage huge percentage like in app i think twitch is like 50 percent instagram you're paying 30 to 40 percent TikTok, you're paying a ton every platform takes a lot we take that away and we put that back in your control so when you tokenize your community when you tokenize your fan club when you tokenize your audience you own the assets you get to sell them back to your community and then there's a secondary market that they can trade so ownership of that asset can unlock anything you want it to a live event a virtual event a channel in your discord private photo stream whatever you want it to unlock but now you control it because you have access to that. So you're not saying like, go to go to TikTok and subscribe to me. If you make some money there, that's great. You're saying, come back home to my community, buy mm. my assets directly from me and be part of what we're building. Mm. So it's really this distinction of building on rented land, which is the way the landscape has typically looked over the last few decades versus now actually owning that audience and owning the property that you're building on. Yeah, have you ever heard of an app called Clubhouse? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, so I was on Clubhouse. I have 86,000 followers on Clubhouse. But the app's kind of dead now. I mean, it's there and it is what it is. But so I busted my tail on an app to build 86,000 followers that I have no way to contact. Exactly. They're gone. Like, and, and if Instagram dies or Facebook dies, then all the effort and energy put there, it's gone. Or the platform decides to deplatform you. Yeah. Just you do something wrong and they don't like you and they hit the button. And it takes like our corporate account at twitter we lost it for two months it was banned for two months and we couldn't get a response mm -hmm. so had we built been building everything on that rented land we would have crashed but mm -hmm. because we bring it back to us and we know who our owners are and we're connected with our community we're able to take that community different places depending on what's going on in the market i'm gonna go just go into the clubhouse thing right now i know you also wrote a book on the clubhouse app called the clubhouse creator um in your view, right, there's so many different social apps that are coming available on a yearly basis now, right? What made Clubhouse work? What made it different? And why did you choose to go there and ultimately succeed um, when you did? Yeah, it's a great question. So we're in the middle of the pandemic. Everybody's or right before the pandemic, but everybody's kind of locked up at home. Um, the yeah. magic started when the pandemic came. Everybody's locked up at home. People like to talk to each other. For me, though, I always got my business going into small rooms and having conversations with people. You put me in a networking event and I make money. It's just it's just easy. And that is what Clubhouse was. So I could go into Clubhouse and help business owners and then be able to make money. My first month on Clubhouse, I made 100 grand cash. Month one. How? I, I ran rooms, audio rooms. I we, we had this big room that a bunch of us ran. It was how to run a million dollar business. Okay. And I knew how to do that. And we would just help people. And then I would go off on my own and run like a real little small room. And people would stop by and I would just talk to them and connect with them. And they would say, what do you do? And I'd say, well, this is what I do. And this is how I help people. And they would say, well, I need help. Uh, I can help you. Here's an offer. And they would just pay me. Okay. So a 12, like a $12,000 coaching offer at that point in time. Um, we had a $500 community offer and a $12,000 coaching offer. And people were just paying left and right because they needed help. They would hear the coaching. They got a live taste of it. It was the lead magnet, right? They're getting to ask their questions. I'm answering them. They're having one-on-one -on -one connection with me. And I say, do you want to go off and do this on your own? Or do you want me to support you for the next year? It's pretty easy then. There you go. Got it. What what other platforms were you using in addition to Clubhouse at that time, or was that pretty much it? That was it. So I had been behind the scenes for like Lewis Howes and Michael Hyatt and company and Gabby Bernstein and Jeff Walker and Dr. Axe and Eric Worre and Ray Higgs and all these big names. I was behind the scenes running marketing for them. I started to build my brand at the end of, end of 2020 when Clubhouse came around. Really went all in. I signed a book deal with Hay House 13 days into the app and just started writing. I had like a four month time frame to get the manuscript done just started writing, started building, started figuring out how to make money on the app, how to build creators on Clubhouse. I'm working on my first book right now and I was actually looking at Hay House, so we might need to connect. Uh, oh, they're great. Outside of this. I've and that's like with Hay House, that's, I was in Jeff Walker's mastermind, which I paid to get in the room. Mm -hmm. And Jeff was a client of mine and Reed Tracy, which is the CEO of Hay House, he was also in the room. And I met Reed and I brought Reed a client and we crushed the book, like hit number nine of all books on Amazon. And then when I wanted to write a book, I just went back to Reed and did a Zoom with me. So it's, that was my relationship is if I could get in a small room and have a conversation with someone, I can build relationships and make money. And that's mm -hmm. what Clubhouse was for me. I wasn't anywhere else though. I had 
I think 2,000 followers on Instagram at the time when I went there. And about 20,000 on Facebook. I played there a lot. Nobody on Twitter. Um, really just went all into Clubhouse and and like 16 hours a day talking to people, sharing stories. Um, it grew my Instagram. I grew like 20,000 followers on Instagram directly mm. from Clubhouse though. I tried Clubhouse for a period. I was also on Stereo and when both of these apps came out, I was like, let me, let me dabble, let me see what it's about. And uh, I think a lot of creators were of the same mindset. I think I just felt for me, like it never, it never took off. And for the time investment I was making, I wasn't seeing that return. Are there any tips or even secrets or strategies that you feel like you were able to bring that really set you apart from what others were doing? It's, well, it's the best place to do market research because you get direct access to a pool of customers and you get to have a two-way conversation and dialogue with them. Yep. So to test an offer, to try an offer, to figure out if your language is landing, to figure out how to explain something, it's the best. And you have to figure out how to do it without video because there's no video. So when you start to tell stories, you have to learn to use analogies and you have to learn to paint visual pictures. So that is, you know, Clubhouse, the tip there is use it to learn to be a better storyteller, use it to learn to be a better speaker. From there, it's really just go in and build, like there's people on every app. I was in a room on Clubhouse two days ago and we had 450 people live in a morning show. So that's, if you don't have an audience of 450 people, there's an audience of 450 people waiting on you. Now, if you have an audience, like if you publish on YouTube or whatever you do and you get huge audience, you're gonna feel like Clubhouse is real small. But if you're listening to the show and you're just getting started, you're trying to figure out your language, you're trying to build your confidence, you need to get some, you know, your first couple of clients, I think Clubhouse is a great place to start. You mentioned the big name influencers that you've worked with, Lewis House, Gab Gabby Bernstein, Michael Hyatt, and others, and collectively helped them generate over 250 million um, within the creator economy. So two part question for you. How did you connect with and meet these people? And then secondly, how did you enable them or empower them to go and be successful entering into these new media places? Yeah, so I met him. It was really funny. I My first person that I met in this industry, the, the coaching industry, was Suzanne Evans. And she was in my town. And somebody reached out to me and said, do you do traffic? I said, I don't know what that is. And I ended up looking up Suzanne on a flight and figuring out she was pretty legit. So I, we worked together for six months. During that time frame, someone had introduced me to Lewis House. And Lewis and I ended up in San Diego speaking at the same event at the same time. And he spoke and I spoke and, you know, we were both speakers and we were both kind of connecting. And he said, well, Gary, I hired someone else. And I just looked him dead in the eye and I said, that's great, but this is hard. And if they don't know this industry, they're going to struggle because I struggled. So you've got two choices. If you want results like I've got, you either need to fire that person and hire me, or you need to give them a year or two of your time to teach them the industry. I've already spent my time to learn, to learn the industry. And he said, Gary, I'll figure it out. And we didn't work together for about a month and then he reached back out to me and he said let's do it and during that time i had picked up i mean we were working with like started working with mast and kip and i just went and started joining masterminds and i would go join 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 and i would meet a new client and then i would deliver results and then that client would refer me to someone else so like we got on brendan burchard's radar he started referring us to people we got on um, jeff walker became our client so his group became clients of ours Kevin Nations was a client. Um, I sold a course one time and Ryan Dice was the only person to buy it. So I just found this little, kind of this little lane of, I got marketing and I understood it. Mm -hmm. And for my clients, I just made it easy for them. You know, we, we served as, my agency as a CMO for Lewis House Company for like five years. From 14 to 19, we ran digital marketing for him. We built his inner circle and all that stuff. But it was all about like, we would do videos and say, hey, Lewis, go do this. We would do an email and say, hey, could you go do that? We just got segmentation, we got marketing, we got moving people through a pipeline or through a funnel. Um, we understood that we needed to keep the top of the funnel real busy and we needed to keep people coming in because if not, then everything at the bottom dried up. And then we just made money. I mean, and it was like, we did $12.5 million teaching people how to sell on Amazon. We did about $750,000 a year for a client teaching horses dressage over the internet. So teaching horses how to dance. Um, we did about $6 million a year online for aromatherapy certifications. We did about $5 million a year online selling pocket knives. Um, but most of like the Jeff Walkers, the Michael Hyatt's people like that, we wrote their funnels. So Jeff was using Aweber and then we moved him to Infusionsoft. Lewis Howes was not using, he was using Keep or Infusionsoft. We moved him to HubSpot. We moved Michael Hyatt to HubSpot. 
So we made big moves in the marketing automation systems at most, most of these companies. So starting out really just building high quality, you know, funnels for these people that are working almost like as a, as a marketing agency, correct? Yeah, like, I mean, I was representing like brick and mortars, like hotels and small businesses, and they didn't pay much money and they wanted a lot of results. I found informational marketers, business coaches, event hosts, podcast hosts, they would pay a lot of money and it was real easy to get results. Mm. So the results that I was used to delivering, I could still deliver, but I could charge like five or six times more. I mean, our package was $90,000 a year. It, it was, I mean, you're right, sheesh. It was 90 grand a year. We started at two and we had a $2,000 or $3,000 package. And then I stopped the $2,000 package. I was in a mastermind with Kevin Nations. I told everybody what my price was. Everybody said, can I hire you at 3K? But you should be at 6K. So I went to 6K a month, like right there. And then I went to 7,500 a month and that was my sweet spot. And I would have people get on a wait list like six or seven months ahead of time to become a client when they were ready. It was, it was just wild. We didn't do any long-term contracts. Every client paid us in advance for the month and we were working with the biggest names in the industry. So you were working on a flat fee basis. You weren't taking a percentage of the sales that you generated. Exactly, flat fee. Um, I didn't like to take percentages. I, looking back on it, it would have probably been pretty smart, but uh, I just felt good in the, I felt good in the money. I felt good in our return. I felt good and I could quickly give them the money back and we become a profit center for them. You know, we would do, I don't know, we would do like big affiliate launches and do like three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars in commissions for one of our clients. And it wow. was just fun and it was easy. It was tiring because we were in a perpetual launch cycle. As a, as a company, we were in a launch every week for a different client. But it was also fun because they were making money hand over fist. Yep. Were you also advising them on, on Web3 and creator economy stuff at this time or were you just building funnels for them? No, we were strictly marketing automation. I wasn't in Web3 until March of 2021. Got it. So That's when I jumped into this. So all of this before was marketing automation funnels. I believe in a real simple co concept called R3MAT, which is right message to the right audience at the right time. Right. right. Really simple. Build a segment of people and give them the right message. If they want to buy chocolate ice cream, just talk to them about chocolate ice cream. If they want to buy strawberry, talk to them about strawberry. Don't try to sell them vanilla. They don't want it. So right message to the right audience at the right time. To that point, you know, this show is for creators. And I mentioned my start on Instagram. I built my theme page, um, New Earth Knowledge, to about 60,000 over the course of a few years. Wow. And I think my constraint when trying to monetize at that time was I just didn't know how to build out funnels. I wasn't great at sales and I had to upscale around those things. But the other piece of that is to be frank is like the audience just didn't have the purchasing power to come in and, and do multi thousand dollar deals for, for the, the products that I was creating. And I would often think, Hey, wouldn't it be nice if I could just get paid for creating really good content. And I know something else you're working on, which is social connector, uh, which is a SaaS tech, you know, platform for creators that are building communities and then enabling them to get paid for basically proof of work. You just hit 25,000 users. Congratulations on that. Um, talk about that concept and the future of that for creators and just how it works a little bit. Yeah, so to me, a creator needs to put a little bit of effort in every day. If you yeah. do consistent daily work, you're going to serve the algorithms better. You're going to show up more. You're going to get build a better relationship with your fans. So we reward consistent daily work. We have a, a little form. Everybody fills it out. We ask you two questions at the top. Did you make money today and did you grow your audience today? Just yes or no. Then we ask you, what did you do today? And you hit the submit button. We give you Gary coin, which is our token inside of our ecosystem. But more than that, you're logging your progress every day. You're keeping track of all the work you do. Our community says they get better results. They show up more. They're focused more because they're focused on did this activity generate audience or did this activity generate revenue? Or was this activity something that I just did and it didn't do either? And I didn't actually need to do it. And that's what we've been building for is how do we keep creators creating? How do we get creators moving? Now, at our core, we help you build community. So we power that. I, I needed all this technology, so we just started building technology to run community. So now you're a creator, you're creating, you're growing your audience. You've got an audience on Instagram or TikTok or Twitter or YouTube. I don't care where they are. 
And now you can say, I have a digital collectible. I have a Discord community. I have a membership and we help you market to your community. So we bring them in from Instagram or TikTok or wherever. We bring them into a central home. We use Discord for that. And then we have email marketing and, and digital collectibles and everything that lay on top of that. So we can reward people for taking actions. We can you know, reward people for showing up. We can incentivize them to hold a token. We can unlock certain doors or bring them into certain events or certain rooms based on what they do and what they own. And then we can market to them based on their ownership. So we have people on our leaderboard that own 120,000 Gary coin and we have people that own one Gary coin. And for a creator, the best part is when someone wants to support me, they know what to do. Go buy Gary coin. When someone wants to support me, they know what they do. Go buy a giraffe. They don't have to figure out, you know, where, where does, where does Gary want support today? And what do I buy? And I, I don't need that course. Let me wait to the next thing. They just get to buy when they're ready. Something else that I was dealing with, and this is, this is no excuse, but it's just recognizing what was, was, was definitely a, a shadow ban. Uh, on my page, I know a lot of creators are dealing with that, with this cancel culture and these platforms sticking their hand in, in, in what they're creating, which is just about the worst thing that can happen to a creator. Um, do, does that stuff go on or will it go on in this Web3 world with platforms like Discord and even places like Clubhouse and other uh, owned communities? Is that something that you're even concerned with? Well, I don't worry about it in my community. I go to the platform, you know, Twitter and Twitter's my primary platform. I go there to build audience and then I bring them back into Discord. Once they're in Discord, I can do whatever I want. Okay. I can say whatever I want. I can talk about whatever I want. It's fully secured. So if you came in my Discord, you couldn't see big sections. You could see what I let you see because you're public. But once you get like a giraffe in your wallet, then all of a sudden a new section opens up for you. Okay. When I run an event, a new door opens up for you. We have like a workshop we're running for four weeks. There's a private channel for the people that are only in that workshop. So mm -hmm. it lets me go off platform, not worry about any shadow bans or anything like that. And it lets me communicate with my audience at my speed and my pace. So they're not going to Twitter to get an update. They're coming to Discord. They're not going to email even to get an update because I mean, it could hit spam folder or something. They always know where to go. And the, the Discord's always on. There's no shadow banning or there's no weirdness that happens there. It's your platform. Cool. I want to take it back to tokenization for a second. Yeah. And you mentioned your Gary coin. You are the second Gary now that I will look to and learn from uh, for crypto and creator stuff. And uh, everybody, of course, uh, who who is on this uh, in this creator and marketing world ha has tapped into Gary V stuff for so long. But um, um, just coming back to this for a second, you know, give a little context to the implications of tokens. Is this something that anyone can be doing or should be doing? Uh, and how do you get started in basically creating your own token? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, for me, I'm building a personal brand. And the biggest challenge that I have in personal branding is name awareness. And I think that's the biggest challenge that anybody has. If you don't know my name, then you can't talk about me at the dinner table. Right. So I named my token Gary Coin. I, I know that's odd and weird, but I just looked at it and I was like, well, I needed to be like four or five characters. My name happened to be Gary. Like, well, if they can name it ETH or Bitcoin, I could name it Gary Coin. And we just made it work. Um, now, should anybody be doing it? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. I think that if you're building a community, you need a tokenization strategy. Now, that's not a fungible token or a social token for everyone like Gary Coin. That could be a, like, let's, let's say it's a soulbound membership card, which never gets transferred. But when you give it to someone, it lets them into your community. Mm -hmm. it, they can't transfer it. There's no secondary market. There's no upside to it. it. It just sits in their wallet. It can never be moved. It's soulbound. Well, that's a tokenization strategy for someone. Um, another tokenization strategy for someone could be, um, if you're active this month and you take this challenge, I'll give you this, this NFT, this collectible, and then you can use that collectible to come to my live event. That's a tokenization strategy for someone. Now, if you're growing a community and your goal is to have giveaways and rewards and, and incentivize people to take micro actions and you want to grow thousands of people in your community, a social token is perfect. So I'd say if you want to grow hundreds of people in your community and that's your goal, I would use a tokenization strategy strategy around digital collectibles, NFTs, um, non-fungible tokens. So we can limit the quantity. We're not getting too supplied. We can control what it is. We can retire seasons and stuff like that. 
if your goal is to build like your thousand true fans or grow, you know, hundreds of thousands of people or grow a big community, one million percent you need to lead into social tokens. Okay. And do you need to have an audience first before you look into creating the token, or is this something that you should do as as soon as you start building? Well, I didn't have an audience, but I also understand that I'm not the same as everybody else. I was determined to get an audience. Yep. So if you're determined to get an audience, then I think it's the best place to start because you can take everyone on the journey with you. Because mm -hmm. what's going to happen is if you go grow, let's say your goal is to get a thousand true fans and you go get your first 250. Well, they're your true fans. So all of a sudden you bring in a social token, you got to talk to those 250 and see what they think. You're probably going to lose 50 of them. Yeah. They don't understand it. They get confused, whatever it is. But if you're getting started and you know you're committed to this and you launch the social token, well, your conversations are different. The people that are coming in and becoming your true fans, they're tokenized from day one. So it goes to your commitment level. I wasn't willing to stop. I'm not willing to stop. So I knew it was the right build for me. But someone else that's saying, you know, AI is really cool. I think I want to be the AI expert and I'm going to try it. And that's probably not the right person to launch a social token. Okay, so you should have some some semblance of expertise uh, in your with you what you're what you're doing. A commitment to your journey, Got because it. if you're going to build something like I mean, think you said you're a blogger, right? Right. So if you were going to go out and start a brand new blog right now about AI, it would take you a little while to get the traffic up and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then if six months from now you decided, well, I don't like AI, I want to go do this other thing, then you would have kind of wasted that six months and you would have to probably get a new domain name, probably write new content, probably get new backlinks, right? right, right. You'd have to do all that work again. Yep. So if you know you're going to blog about AI, well, that's awesome. We can get moving. But if you're still figuring out, is AI my thing, then I would rather you figure it out first before mm -hmm. we go in and start building tokenization strategies. Make sure you're going to stick there for a bit. The namesake of this program is Models of Masters. I'm going to put you on the spot for just a second and ask for the biggest or best model for creators or that you've discovered as a creator yourself. Um, for 2023 and moving forward, it could be creation, it could be marketing, it could be just business strategy, but is there anything that's top of mind for you? So there's this book, it's right here. I don't know if you've read this, have you? I have not. That looks great. So it, it's it's a great book. Um, the author's name is Austin Cleon. And chapter six, it says The Secret. Mm. And it says, do good work and share it with people. The yeah. book is called Still Like an Artist. And what I think we should do as creators in 2023 is still like an artist. I think we should go find something that we like and we should innovate around it. We should make it our own and we should customize it for us. I don't think everybody is made to sit here and try to think of the next big thing, the next big innovative thing that's going to change the world. Just take something that works and say, ooh, if I put this little spin on it, oh, that would be great. If I did this, it would be great and start building. So I think the thing that every creator could do is just steal like an artist. But that's not copy. That is truly look at it, get inspired and go create. Right. And everybody is becoming a personal brand today and i think gary v talks about this a lot as well five ten years from now everyone's going to be a personal brand resumes will disappear and it'll just be what's your brand what are you creating what are you putting out i'm already getting getting asked that what, what's your what's your brand what's your website right and you almost need one right content creation has become table stakes these days that's not a defensible skill that you can compete on um at least not in the way you you used to you know years ago it's it's becoming democratized but i think that is a good thing and um it's making creation really the core of this new attention economy which is amazing for people like us yeah so it is i think it's it's just an amazing time to be a creator i think most people that are in a, in a in a job and you're making a salary or a wage it's relatively easy for you to replace that as a creator there's brands looking for creators or looking for partnerships yeah. Yeah. nano or micro influencers is perfect right now like that's hot right now it's not it's not as hot to have millions of followers as it is to have like a small like super niche audience that's like hyperactive and and reacts to everything that you do that's what's in right now so i think that, it's a great time to be a creator that's the best asset you can own is a loyal and engaged audience that literally trusts you looks to you as the authority and 
is willing to invest with you. Gary, this has been a great conversation. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Most definitely. Thank you so much. This has been amazing.